but I think we'll move on now to our next panel discussion, which is pushing through the pandemic, digitalization, licensing, and shared print. And I'll hand things over to you, Laurie. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, just fine, thank you. Okay. Hi, I'm Laurie McAllister. I am the Associate University Librarian for Collection Services and Analysis at Arizona State University. Uh, and welcome to our session, Pushing Through the Pandemic, Digital Availability. Uh, and I'm joined by three panelists uh, who are um, Sherry Michaels, Michael Rodriguez, and Carrie Scott. And I'd like to ask them just to introduce themselves briefly uh, in that order, please. Hi, uh, I'm Sherry Michaels. I'm the Head of Collection Management at Indiana University and um, also the, uh, the um, I always forget the second half of my title, uh, the Library Director for MDPI uh, Library Operations, which is a media digitization project. And good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Rodriguez. I'm collection strategist at the University of Connecticut Libraries and uh, one of UConn's uh, main liaisons with the, uh, with the EAST project. Hi, I'm Carrie Scott. I'm the AUL for Collections and Services at University of California, Santa Cruz. Thank you. Uh, I should also mention that uh, Arizona State University is a member of, of West. Uh, so, uh, thanks for all of my panelists. Uh, we would like to also thank Matthew Revit for coordinating this meeting. And we wanted to kind of end on a, a note that brings us back to our current situation, which is that we are all in a remote mode here at PAN, and that um, we've all um, We've all experienced um, some different perspectives on some of the work that we're doing, including the shared print archiving work. Uh, so with most of our libraries closed and many of us working remotely, uh, the pandemic has had a significant impact on our users, our staff, and our library services. Uh, it's been a time for a lot of us to reflect on the importance of print, print archiving, and the availability of our collections. Uh, it's also an opportunity to consider shifting our efforts to potentially accommodate new service realities. And we're also interested in a future that could accommodate more nimble approaches to broader access to our collective collections. So with that, we have three questions for our panelists. Um, and could we um, change the slide? Thank you. Uh, we have three prompts. Uh, and what we hope to do is um, our panelists uh, we're all going to answer these questions, but we wanted to make them broad enough that we could also um, have answers from our participants. And if you would um, feel free to type your um, responses into the chat or save some of your uh, observations for our ending Q&A. Okay, the first prompt. What are ways that we can enable broader resource access to our communities, not just when we're working remotely, but bringing that spirit to our work moving forward? And I'd like to start with Carrie Scott. Totally surprised me with that start. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, so I think um, that in thinking about this, I think one of the things that we need to do uh, after in the post-COVID world or in some iteration of the post-COVID world is that we need to start exploring uh, more controlled digital lending and, um, and expand our view of what a shared print collection offers or affords, not just to its paying and supporting members, but what it affords outside of that membership. I think that COVID and ETOS in particularly, I feel like I've, I can see the outskirts of the city and I want to get to the, to the city now after this ETOS experiment that we've been in, I think it's really expanded the concept of ownership to the consortial level. So for an example of the University of California, our collections are, if, we're, if it's owned in the University of California, it's accessible to uh, any University of California library. So if it's in Hati and it's been scanned. So in that way, the digitized versions of our shared print collections have become both 
our circulating collection, and in some ways they've become our consortial ILOable collection. And because it doesn't matter really uh, whose book was scanned, it just matters that you it's owned and you can get access to it that way. So I think we need to really start thinking of the shared print collection as the collections we own together in our shared print initiatives and also that we need to be able to lend the digital versions of our collections within the shared print community and beyond. Because if we think about our print versions of shared print, right, um, in the pre-COVID world, we had print versions that we would agree to share, right? We would send them to people in the collective if they needed that copy. Um, or uh, we would also send them to people who we had normal ILL agreements with. So while I understand why we don't think of it that way in the pre-COVID world, I think in the post-COVID world, we need to start pushing the envelope a little bit more in that direction. And I get that the um, defensibility of, of ETOS right now is that none of us have access to the buildings, right? So we can do that one-to-one -one, um, lending without any problems or concerns about what we're doing. And I think um, as, you know, when we talk about building infrastructure and efficiencies, we need to be thinking to the future of how are we going to start lending these things in a way that is uh, within copyright law and principles. And, um, and, and I think we also need to start thinking that if we're going to incentivize people to be members in shared print communities, uh, a big incentive is if you participate and you're a part of this collective, you have access to this, right? Because if the future of, as the CDL, CRL, how do you trust group said, the future of print is shared. If that's true, then probably a lot of the future of sharing is digital. And we need to be thinking about that. Thank you. Michael, would you like to offer your insight here? I think very much riffing off what um, what my colleague said, um, I think we need to center control digital lending in a much more uh, intentional way moving forward. And Hathi Trust, I think, has really opened the door toward a much larger conversation around the ongoing availability of those resources. Um, certainly, the Internet Archive lawsuit has complicated that question. Uh, but I think it's a strategic direction for shared print initiatives to continue to explore. And as Roger Schoenfeld has said, this is Hathi Trust's example uh, is very much a model of long-term investments in digitization and digital preservation paying off. That said, I think the crisis has also exposed some, um, in, my, in my initial notes, I, I called them structural deficiencies. What I would rather call them is latent opportunities. And there are these latent opportunities in areas such as licensing and resource sharing in particular um, that have really been foregrounded during the time of the pandemic when physical libraries are inaccessible and when physical interlibrary loan is in most cases not practical due to staff not being in the building. Um, what we really need at a, at a large scale is working with publishers at a consortial level to enable whole book, whole ebook interlibrary lending um, at scale. And there are certainly mechanisms of doing this currently. Uh, Viva Consortium has, in Virginia has done amazing work um, with whole ebook lending. Uh, Colorado Alliance has a, uh, a um, controlled digital lending program for streaming video with Alexander Street Press. So there are pioneers in that space. Um, and UConn, we have also uh, worked with uh, 10 major publishers, including Cambridge University Press and Deuter and many others, to allow interlibrary lending of whole ebooks that we acquire from them electronically uh, uh, under our license agreements. And since the pandemic began, we've seen an 800% increase in lending requests uh, coming from other libraries for those ebooks. So I think this the crisis, I think, has very much foregrounded the importance of centering interlibrary loan as a, or of whole ebooks as an essential part of our monographic ecosystem uh, writ large. The other point I would make is I was really appreciative of the fact that 
this prompt specifies are communities, multiple communities. And during this crisis, I think it's important for us not to lose sight of the communities beyond the shared print partners and beyond the research universities, but also be thinking of our communities, and I, I work at a large state institution, of the other state institutions and potentially even the members of the public uh, who may rely on, uh, on digital and print access that um, institutions with the economic power of, of a UConn or a UMass or a UC are able to provide. So I think there are opportunities to potentially collaborate with, even with public libraries, for example, on initiatives like the Simply E Marketplace and eBook uh, Reader app, which DPLA and Lyricist have been, and New York Public Library have been, uh, have been developing and rolling out uh, in Connecticut and, and beyond. I think it also exposes some of the limitations of the ebook marketplace. Um, again, I'm talking about the licensed ebook marketplace right now. Um, when I went um, to look for, when I went into Gobi and looked for um, anti-racist ebooks to purchase uh, for our community, I found that a third of the widely recommended uh, titles are simply not available for academic libraries to purchase. They may be available for individuals in e-format. They may be available to public libraries. But academic libraries are excluded from acquiring electronic content that is critical for their communities and, and, and for their students. So again, I think there's an opportunity there to work across the industry, across different library types, um, to facilitate greater uh, greater availability and better rights uh, for our electronic monitoring and also to advocate for uh, improvements around uh, things like digital rights management and concurrent user restrictions and, and improved um, accessibility of licensed collections. Uh, back to you, Lori. Thank you. Uh, Sherry, would you like to add? Uh, sure. So uh, building off of what uh, Michael just said, I think uh, we're going to have to rely on the communities. I want to uh, just say how grateful we have been uh, to be able to rely on the Hottie Trust emergency access um, during this time. And that has been built on the work that so many others have done uh, in order to facilitate that. But it also has brought to light um, some inequalities of access because uh, you know, IU is a very well, uh, pretty well resourced uh, institution and there are still an awful lot of things that we don't have uh, access to because they haven't been digitized uh, yet. And so trying to figure out, um, looking forward, how can we increase access to even more materials uh, has been something that's that's been on my mind. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, one of the, per the projects I have been heavily involved in the last couple of years is actually a, a media digitization and preservation uh, initiative. And so I'm, I know this particular form is about shared print, but uh, we're also looking at other formats and being able to preserve those and make sure that they are uh, accessible as well. But uh, I just want to also echo uh, Carrie and Michael about uh, the desire and interest in controlled digital lending um, and also advocating for uh, being able to share those electronic resources that we do have subscribed to. Uh, we've gotten um, a lot of requests for things that we just simply can't cannot share uh, due to licensing agreements. So trying to figure out how we can continue to advocate for access, especially for some of our partners that are maybe not uh, as well resourced. Um, and I'm just going to tack on one additional thing that I want to talk about. Uh, you know, we're all working remotely, but um, the, some of the things that we can continue to do are try to continue to build this community. I know within, um, you know, by attending meetings like this and uh, 
the Big Ten Academic Alliance, the ILL directors, we've actually been meeting much more regularly during this time than we normally do, uh, trying to keep each other involved and trying to figure out, well, what are you doing and what are you doing? And it's just been so incredibly helpful. Um, and uh, those peers in our network have uh, really helped uh, us to be able to address the issues that we've been trying to, um, you know, during this time so that we can uh, increase our access to all these materials. And uh, it's just been so helpful. Um, I Thank you all. Uh, I would like to um, echo that the pandemic has really brought equity and access uh, to the forefront for us at Arizona State University and uh, that it has made me realize that how, um, how privileged we are to have such a dynamic uh, resource sharing uh, network uh, for digital. And um, I think that I agree that really um, looking at resource sharing, licensing, opening up more of our collections uh, is, is definitely something we should be putting effort into uh, moving forward. So we'll move on to our second prompt. Please change the slide. Thank you. Uh, so let's focus on our network for a moment. Uh, what is one thing that we can do as a network or as a network of networks that will improve our overall management of the collective collection? Uh, and I will go back again to Carrie uh, for uh, her initial thoughts on this. Thanks. Um, so I'm totally going to cheat a little bit on this and say and use a catch all phrase for what I think my one thing is that we should do as a network and then uh, describe more than one thing. Sorry. So my phrase is going to be double down. I think that, um, you know, we really need to, you know, if if as CDL and CRL and how do you trust say the future is shared print. Um, and if shared print is, is our last or one of the last just in time, we're working together to try to guess, make educated guesses about what might be needed in the future. Um, I think we need to double down on the, the COVID experience because it's really highlighted the things that we're doing really well right now and that we need to continue doing. Um, again, the ETOS is something that I think we're doing really well. And it's also highlighting um, just to sort of echo what Michael was saying, I think the Internet Archive experience, it, it's, it's too bad, but it also represents an opportunity for us because I think we're different, differently positioned. So I think we need to double down and be, uh, you know, there's strength in numbers, and I think we need to be uh, out in the forefront and be um, as aggressive as a group of librarians get in, in this area and um, really focus on engaging and having more conversations about how we can how we can make these things uh, accessible once we preserve them. I also think we need to double down on our commitments uh, to work together that, you know, funding and supporting the work of shared print networks is is uh, more important than ever. And we need to really, as Susan Stern said earlier and other people echoed, that our messaging about the value of shared print is really important. And uh, COVID uh, has given us the perfect story for why it's important, right? Before, I mean, and all these shared print groups were on, we hear people say it's really difficult to make an argument. A new director comes in and they say, why are we investing in shared print? And now we have a real time example of why we're investing in shared print that, that's easily explainable beyond the um, really important and great other reasons we're investing in shared print, but this gives us a really good tangible thing to, to talk to people about and engage people with. So I think we also need to um, double down on uh, talking. Another part of the communication piece is that we've really got to start talking to people about the, um, the and I think that ETOS gives us this opportunity about the a lot of times people are not interested, people, patrons, libraries talk about not being interested in um, removing things from their collection because what if we don't have access to it, right? So I think, again, we've got to uh, incentivize people to participate in, in shared print groups by talking about the not just the, the possibilities that ETAS gave us, but that we, we um, uh, if we think about ourselves as this community, that we all are all in on these collections, then 
that access expands exponentially. And those are the kinds of things I think we need to be talking to each other about. And um, that the benefit of having all these groups working together is that we can really uh, engage collectively in ways that us talking to our individual faculty or individual administrators doesn't really have the same kind of impact unless we've got, you know, we've got this huge community behind us. And so that's what my thoughts are about that question. Uh, and I like that you have, uh, that you use double down in, in all of your responses. So thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to, to add on? Sure. Um, I think my most, um, I'm also going to cheat a tiny bit, uh, but this one is obvious. Um, I think as the Partnership for Shared Book Collections and the Rose Bond Alliance have, have really modeled for us um, the, the potential in moving toward a national collective collection model. Um, we've done amazing work in regionalization and expanding that. But the ability to scale at a national and even a North American model, I think, is really where the transformative value can come in. And I'm really excited to see the partnership and Rosemont um, moving forward with uh, co helping to coordinate those kinds of strategies. Um, I think the, the, the perhaps less obvious thing I will add to the conversation is that I see it as important to envision the collective collection as production and not just as maintenance. And by production, I really mean digitization and digital preservation. So identifying those last copies, those unique items, those brittle items that are perhaps not in a, in a state that is usable for the intended user, and then digitizing those kinds of materials and ensuring their digital preservation and, and thereby realizing the potential of that knowledge which may have previously existed only in a single print copy in one library somewhere. Um, I think the, the, the focus on last copies and on riddle material, um, I think um, it blurs the traditional boundary between distinctive and general collections. And I think that's a really healthy direction to move in. Um, and it helps us sort of realize um, what Lorcan Dempsey noted so many years ago, that the future lies in the inside-out model in, in identifying your library's pockets of distinctiveness and then creating opportunities to share that distinctive value with the world. Um, so I think we need to, uh, to think very, um, very proactively, particularly in the time of a pandemic, again, when, when shared print is inaccessible, about the role of digitization uh, in shared print initiatives, uh, uh, particularly for those rare or brittle items. Um, and, and certainly, uh, and we're already having those conversations uh, within EAST, and, and thanks to Susan Sturms and her colleagues on the EAST project team who are, who are excited about exploring those conversations. And I think, too, there's, I'm always conscious of the, of the risk of, um, of sort of lionizing uh, the physical object um, because of its physicality and rather and not only because of its necessity. Um, in the last few years we've seen uh, Kansas State University library flood. Um, we've seen New York's Museum of Chinese in America burn. I think it's critical that we preserve the scholarly record um, through digital as well as physical means um, as this as this forum has underscored how well those mean, those, those formats complement each other. Um, and I think those are a couple of the directions that we can look at as a network and as a collective network that will improve the overall management of our collective collection. And I definitely had more than one thing there. <laughs> no worries. They're absolutely relevant. Uh, Sherry, would you like to uh, offer your thoughts? Uh, sure. I, I can't say I have a whole lot more to add. Uh, Michael pretty much stole my uh, answer in terms of, uh, you know, digitization. But I think really we've heard many things today in terms of um, activities and uh, things that are working, uh, including, you know, uh, getting networks to talk to each other, um, funding to support positions to help um, do some of the work that needs to happen across different networks. Um, and then, uh, so I would, my 
One thing I was going to talk about was uh, inventory or getting the records uh, reliable so that uh, when we're making decisions at scale, we have some confidence that those decisions are um, based in reality and not wishful thinking. Um, and uh, But I really like Carrie's point that um, that the, this whole pandemic and the Hathi Trust uh, emergency access has given us a real world example of a way to talk about how important this work is um, because I think for so many people for so long it's been very abstract and oh, allows me to save a little shelf space um, and but they didn't know what they were getting back out of it and now we have a real world example of saying well when we take the time to digitize and have the records correct and do all of this work to make it available. This is what can happen um, in an emergency. And so we want to continue to do that work long after this uh, time period is over. Absolutely, uh, because we don't know what the future holds. So uh, having, having more and more available uh, is definitely the way to, to head. Uh, okay, I have, we have one more prompt. Next slide, please. Uh, so access to information is what brings us all together. Uh, publishers, vendors, libraries, and our users. What is one suggestion that could move us all toward a future in which more resources are available to more people? Uh, we have, we, there have been many examples uh, of this today at our meeting. So what I'm hoping is that we can emphasize or, or bring it uh, into focus or give an example of uh, what one of these things is and how it has become more clear to you in this during this pandemic. Uh, Carrie, would you like to go first? Sure. I'm not sure I'm going to talk about things that we've talked about today. However, um, I think I'm so I'm just going to throw a wrench in that. Um, I, I think going back to um, what Michael was saying about working with publishers and talking about licensing agreements, this this has made me think a lot about um, what's the common denominator between and among uh, publishers, libraries, and vendors. And I, I think, you know, beyond the fact that we're, we're dealing with each other and licensing things and talking about things, I think it's authors. And we are, we're interacting with authors at different stages of their, uh, of their work. And um, whatever agreements authors affect with publishers impact what we're able to do with an ebook copy of something or a print copy of something. Right. So I think that just as we have been engaging as a library community with authors about what they think about when they go to publish their journal articles, we need to be engaging with them more proactively. And by we, I mean the shared print community needs to be engaging with them about what they think about when they go to publish their book. Right. And I totally understand that. Um, uh, that an author is concerned, an author and a publisher are concerned with revenue loss, right? That everything could represent a, a lost revenue. That the, the reason why when we go to look for the books about, um, you know, anti-racism, that we're not finding copies that have multi-user access, there's, there's a reason for that, right? But I think that we are in a position as a shared print group, as librarians representing this, to be able to start engaging in conversations about what it is we're actually trying to do with all of us, what we're all trying to do, we have a common common purpose in the end, um, that we're trying to make these things accessible for the promotion of arts and sciences, which is what copyright is supposed to be about. So I think that we should be, we should be engaging in that conversation with publishers, vendors, authors about, you know, what kind of agreements can we strike uh, when, you're, when we're talking to authors, what are the things we're saying to them? When you go to publish a, you know, a second edition of a book uh, that's a compilation of previously published uh, um, uh, works, why are you giving us a one user access license? You know, that we're, you know, we're the, we wanna make these things accessible. People need to be able to build on the work that you've done. Let's talk about how we can engage differently. And I, because I think that the success that we've had in the journal world, in the open access world is because we have found that common ground. We're not coming in as combatants, right? We're talking about where's, where are our common interests? How can we move forward? And I think there is an opportunity here because um, that we haven't fully exploited and that the opportunity that having this shared print group uh, talking about the benefits of shared print, 
that's another sort of avenue in to try to help affect um, change between and among us. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Michael, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, I just have to echo Carrie's comments about engaging with the entire ecosystem. Uh, it's not simply publishers versus libraries, but about the actual um, creators of that, of that knowledge and consumers of that knowledge, our patrons, our faculty, our authors, our users. Um, so I love that uh, approach of um, really thinking about how to engage with them so they understand uh, our positions and ultimately the needs of our of our consumers. And I think and, and things like the like the Wikipedia article that the Partnership for Shared Books uh, uh, crafted, I think, is an, a good example of ways to to communicate out the that, the meaning and the impact of collective collections. Um, in terms of a single thing that we can do uh, to move us toward a uh, a future with greater resource access. Uh, I heard a lot today um, about infrastructure, a lot about WorldCat and, and paper and, um, and metadata and uh, validation and really these sort of infrastructural components of uh, shared print. What I would like to see as a long-term strategic direction, though, um, is moving beyond the maintenance of existing collections and exploring collective collection development, where libraries can examine strengths and collecting areas and make meaningful commitments to each other to uh, subscribe to certain journals or purchase certain back files and then share those materials um, as freely as possible. I think that is a, particularly at a consortial level, that is a, that's a critical uh, future direction for us to explore. Uh, and there, while there are not a whole lot of models out there, at least, uh, at least not in my particular region of the country, uh, I think it's, a, um, it's going to be the next step in the collective collection. Back to you, Laurie. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sherry, would you like to offer some insight here? Um, well, I'm just going to say, uh, for me, uh, one of the things I heard consistently today is uh, it's all about the money. And, um, and quite frankly, that scares me a little bit, considering that uh, budget cuts that are uh, looming for a lot of people um, due to this pandemic. So uh, I heard several people talk about halftime positions and to do the assessment work and to build this infrastructure. That all takes resources. And uh, in, especially in very tight times, there's going to be a competition for the resources. And so I actually want to throw this more out to some of the uh, other participants and say, you know, it, does this concern you that shared print actually might be um, one of the casualties of uh, a post-pandemic world? And, you know, if we haven't made a strong enough case up to this point uh, for the necessary parts that we've been doing, you know, some people might see that as an easy place to uh, to save a few bucks. So uh, I, for me, it does really very much come down to the funding and the resources to continue this work. And I have to say I'm a little concerned, uh, given our present situation, how, how that might actually look post-pandemic uh, world. I think a lot of us are are in the same in the same situation. So at this point, uh, we would like to open it up to uh, our participants to uh, give us questions or to um, offer their insights as well. Thank you, Laurie. We have had a com couple of questions come in through the chat, so I'll just post these to you as I'm uh, as they came through. But the first question is: What does the panel think of the one-to-one -one principle? of controlled digital lending in an environment where we can deliver drawing down the number of physical copies held. Do we track deselection so we can justify multiple simultaneous uses? Does the one-to-one -one principle just limit us? I say no. <laughs> I say I say that to to create a process where we have to track what we used to have, I mean if probably there are lots of things we had and we no longer have over the course of time we've all purchased these books. 
uh, probably in triplicate over the years. I think we have to think of the shared print collections as our collections and that that some library in that collective owns the physical copy and we are in, we all own that physical copy. That's how I think we have to think about it because we're I mean, that's insane to track. I mean, to track everything we we withdrew and in, in perpetuity, I think that would be uh, problematic and I would hope that we wouldn't have to do that. Uh, Michael or Sherry, would you like to, to add? No pressure. Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in and just, uh, and just echo uh, what my colleague said. Um, I, I think the one-to-one -one principle of CDL is challenging in a, in, a, in a consortial context when it's predicated on retention of the print material. Um, because so many libraries are deaccessioning a lot of that print material. So if, if we do a one-to-one -one ratio, and, and if that model of CDL persists, um, I think one of the directions we want to look at um, would, and, and no pressure hot to trust, would be to make that one-to-one -one ratio consortium-wide. So look at the total number of copies held in the system, and then make um, the digital surrogate lendable um, based on that number of copies. So if there are 10 copies throughout um, member library holdings, then uh, make it 10 concurrent users at a time, consortium-wide. And that sort of, I think, aligns with the one-to-one -one principle, but also makes it more of a, a collective ownership model and doesn't necessarily uh, make a library's access entirely reliant on their individual retention of, of a physical copy. Thank you. Um, I, I do think that it comes back to what Sherry mentioned, which is it's all about money, honestly. Uh, you know, who uh, an intellectual property and how, how the community, including our authors, thinks about um, not just collective collections, but in, in, our, but in building our scholarly uh, body of work in general. I, I think it's a matter of um, how we all think about that collectively. Okay, Matthew, are there other questions? There's just a follow-up to that question, actually, before we get on to one of the others, and, and uh, it came from Alison, and Alison's question, uh, comment was, sorry, but um, let me just open this up, but in the future, we won't have those 10 copies in a consortium. I think that was to Michael's, to Michael's comment because of the deaccessioning, maybe. Is Alison referring to him? I think that's a very fair observation. Um, I hope that we're sort of headed in the direction of a last copies principle that would say something along the lines of, of three copies uh, in, a, in a shared print initiative. So at least there would be multiple copies um, in a consortial context, even if it's not the, the number of copies that we would want um, over time. And a number of shared print programs like the one you're part of, Michael, with East, do have that built into their retention rules that there are multiple copies kept of a, of a title. Not for these reasons, but, but that might be something that that would be a benefit of in the future. And I'll add, too, um, uh, that based on the usage that Internet Archive has reported of their National Emergency Library and based on the usage that we've been seeing locally as part of our HathiTrust ETAS program, the vast majority of titles are not used at all and are not used concurrently. So it's possible that even a, 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 um, a restricted model of concurrent access at a consortial scale would still address a lot of the need for, um, for those materials. But that's something I think uh, um, has the pandemic has really facilitated us actually gathering data to be able to make that kind of generalization and make these kind of assessments that can inform our strategies moving forward. Thank you, Michael. So, yeah, were there other questions? Yep. The, the next question we've got, it, it's a pretty big question. Um, how will the lawsuit of the National Emergency Library slash Open Library affect the future of resource sharing.
Good question. <laughs> Would anyone like to tackle that one? I mean, I think it's still to be determined. Any observations from the panelists? Why is we? I'm oh, sorry, Marco, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Matt. Um, uh, just echoing Lori that I, it's very much undetermined at this time. Um, the the lawsuit in question is a bit tricky because on the one hand it, it attacks the National Emergency Library, which was an unlimited concurrent user CDL model, which is not traditionally how CDL has been framed. Um, but it does also attack the OpenLibrary.org model of one global user at a time. Um, so there may be two very different approaches that the courts could take, assuming that it gets to a trial phase. Uh, I will say I was very encouraged to see that EFF um, is going to be supporting the Internet Archive on a pro bono basis in that lawsuit. Um, so it does look like uh, other organizations are outside of the immediate library community are, 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 recognizing, um, are recognizing the importance of this lawsuit long term. And actually, we just had a question coming come in that kind of follows along those lines, which is, should institutions invested in the outcomes of CDL invest in the legal defense of Internet Archive in the court? Another very good question. Uh, and I guess I would bring this back to um, uh, Jerry's comment that it's all about money and is is shared print a casualty of the post-pandemic world? Uh, and with the economic uncertainty that we're all facing in, in, and possibly budget cuts, uh, how will we want to prioritize our spending, uh, you know, internally and also externally on, on some of these um, efforts? So uh, for Carrie, it was double down, right? So we should invest more in our shared print networks. Um, what do our what do our panelists think about uh, in, about investments, and particularly with regard to this question? Well, I can say that the um, the Big Ten, you know, uh, we just recently worked with OCLC, and they. Uh, produced a report based on our collections on the co um, collaborating more closely um, and treating it as one large collection. And I believe that the, you know, the Big Ten uh, universities certainly will continue uh, on the investment uh, side of can trying to uh, continue this. I don't have a lot to say about the um, the lawsuit itself because uh, I, I think they were actually um, pushing the boundaries a little bit. So um, I'm not sure uh, whether we would want to participate and, and try to defend that. I certainly can see the advantages of controlled digital lending. I just think uh, whether or not it, it needed to be more uh, traditional control digital lending and not open uh, that much. So uh, I'll be paying close attention to the lawsuit itself, but I will say from an institutional perspective that we will, I'm fairly confident that we will continue to invest in the notion of a um, collective collection uh, amongst the Big Ten. Yeah, I can't speak for all of UC, <laughs> but I can speak for UC Santa Cruz and say that uh, we will continue to invest in shared print. I mean, like I said in one of my responses, I've like I've seen the outskirts of the city. I want to get in, and I think it's an I think it's important that we do this. As far as investing in in supporting uh, the Internet Archive in the lawsuit, I think we can we can definitely uh, speak out for the the um, for the. I think what they did was important. I think it's it um, again. I think it provides an opportunity for us to talk about um, where that uh, reasonable middle ground that tries to make things accessible. Um, we have a we're different from the Internet Ar Internet Archive. We have some overlapping interests, but we're different. And I think our our difference in this conversation is something that would be even probably I'm going to say even more valuable than giving money to support the support the uh, support the um, action. 
the one comment we got in from the from the chat was um what about non-monetary investment so um advocacy and action more than actually supporting it financially mm -hmm. definitely would support that um in yukon library was one of the original uh supporters of the move um when internet archive reached out to academic libraries and, and encouraged them to to sign on in support of the national emergency library and the lawsuit in this case, I think, is tricky because it really is not, um, it's not an ideal test case for CDL, right, with the, with the unlimited user model, with the fact that Internet Archive is not necessarily a traditional library in some respects. But I would hope that organizations that represent the library community and or um, see CDL as part of their futures would perhaps file amicus brief on behalf of of Internet Archive and on behalf of CDL and uh, educate and advocate um, their memberships and with the public around the issue of controlled digital lending, distinct from the National Emergency L Arch Library, which I think was defensible only in that very specific context of a global pandemic. Another comment we, we had in the chat was that the Big Ten Library Directors have also turned to collaborative efforts as a way to make it through the financial crises. And there's an expectation that we can return to economic results through collective action. That's a positive, positive tone on that one. Um, we do have some more questions that are coming in. Um, how has the current situation highlighted the national limits of our programs? Things like ETAS don't necessarily cross borders. And one argument for print has always been the limited access um, of countries without robust internet. How can we foster access globally, or at least to Canada? Sherry, are you going to take that one? Uh, oh, I'll start. <laughs> How about that? So okay. I was, you know, um, that's a great question because, uh, especially at, at IU, we have a very large. Um, area studies collection um, and uh, even within that we have a hard time collecting just because so many of those resources aren't available electronically and trying to get print from um, a lot of the countries that don't really have a robust uh, publishing network uh, or distribution network uh, makes it really difficult in order to even collect those materials in the first place so uh, I know one of the things that we've done is we've partnered with another Big Ten um, and we agree to share um, collecting uh, responsibilities in certain areas, you collect that, we'll collect this, and then together we have uh, can stretch our dollars and try to get uh, things uh, in, in that area a little easier and so, uh, but I think, you know, during this whole uh, pandemic and not being able to share um, some of the resources through traditional uh, ILL networks has made it even more difficult because, um, you know, we have the print sitting on our shelf that I can't get to to lend to anybody uh, and it has not yet been digitized. So uh, I think that goes back to the original of, you know, things that we can do post pandemic is to try to continue to digitize um, as much as possible and so that we can try to continue to share, um, especially with uh, those countries from which we get those materials uh, and they might not even have access to themselves. Thank you. Another question we've got through here, um, bear with me, it's quite a long one, but moving to a model of collective ownership would seem to require no cost for typical ILL. If you own something, you shouldn't have to pay to use it. Obviously, this has a cost for lenders, so will we need to make a compelling enough argument that reciprocal ILL is an acceptable cost for member libraries to take on? Uh, I think the answer is yes, uh, and that uh, this is part of our commitment, um, commitment to service excellence. <laughs> However, uh, happy to hear from uh, our panelists on their on their thoughts. 
uh, I'll, I'll jump in here because I also um, supervise the ILL department. And so I'll say within the Big Ten, we don't charge each other. And if you look at the OCLC statistics for the top 10 uh, lenders and borrowers, most of the Big Ten are in that list. Um, and so it hasn't had a negative impact uh, in terms of the, our ability to provide um, services. We do um, charge out of state libraries um, and that is something that we'll continue to look at and whether or not that is still necessary. Um, but within our own network um, of the Big Ten and as well as the state, we do treat it as one collection um, and we do not charge uh, each other to move the materials around. So I think a lot of networks have sprung up around those models already. Uh, we are certainly not unique uh, in that regard. So um, for me, the question is whether or not uh, we should continue uh, to expand those networks and maybe uh, eliminate more charges um, for some of the other schools, especially that can't afford uh, for me, it's starting to become an equity uh, 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 issue. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, and, and the more we expand it, the more benefit we get. So it's the return on investment is, is strong. I don't think it's an issue. I'll echo that. I mean, we're already part of a number of networks that do not charge uh, members of a network for, for physical uh, lending or borrowing beyond the, um, beyond the actual cost of shipment. Um, so that's, it, there's certainly a, a large number of precedents for, for scaling that model up. Thank and you. I, oh, sorry. I also, I also think that it gets to our, uh, who, is, who are our communities, who are we serving? And it takes it from an institutional model where we serve our users to uh, the network serves our users we are all, you know, we are all the collection. And so it just is going to be a, some discussion, I think, at that level, at our kind of network of networks level on, are we going to consider all of us collectively as a user base? Thank you. The next question, um, this is a great question. Um, as we think about digital resource access and moving beyond sharing, how might the current spotlighting of systematic bias and the perpetual of structures of oppression influence our critical thinking about post-COVID retention and digitization of print collections? Uh, well, I, I'll, start, I'll start our answer, which I think a big part of this gets into equity and digital access in general. Uh, what it has made clear is that we not only at, at ASU is that we not only need to look at what we provide digitally, but um, also uh, can, we are actually continuing to provide print services because of exactly this. Um, we mail uh, books to users who are not able to, um, who are not close to a, a library. And uh, this, is, this is absolutely something that we think about. Um, I'll, I'll let our panelists uh, add on. Yeah, I think it's a great point, Lori. Um, I think it's actually a great question. I think it's just something that everyone needs to be asking themselves right now. Is how can we facilitate um, a greater e equity and access to uh, not only materials, but, you know, how can we help, um, uh, you know, some of the uh, schools and, uh, in the network that don't have as many resources um, as we do? Um, and uh, how can we, you know, bring the whole group up um, is something that I've been trying to think about, uh, certainly in the last few weeks, uh, especially. 
I mean, I think expanding the network too, like the uh, academic libraries tend to buy the same things, right? So we're, there's a lot of overlap in, in our collections. I think expanding what we, who we, who we include in the shared print community, how we include people in the in libraries, um, small, large, academic, public, how we, how we um, engage everybody will also expand the, um, the range of collections that we're that we're preserving because we are like if you look at when we did a project to see how how much duplication do we have before we pull, remove things from our collection we have a lot of duplication right so trying to make sure that we're we're going out there and I think that the um, the partnership is one of the one of the entities that is really going to make that possible that we can start engaging beyond ourselves right and and make things more expansive and. Uh, which doesn't get to equity of access, but it does get to at least trying to make sure that we are expanding what we're preserving because we're just looking at each other, preserving the same things. I think getting to the point of uh, of bibliodiversity, I, I mean that's that's crucial in any shared print collection, and I think some of the um, some of the challenges of uh, of shared print is that because institutions have historically collected from the canon, right? The white male Western canon. That's what we're preserving in large part. So I, in order to really center diversity in our collections, we have to also look beyond those collections as they exist and look at deeper relationships with our archives and special collections, which tend to hold the, the most distinctive material, the diverse the material that's representative of uh, communities that are underrepresented in our, in our typical collections, and, and collaborating with them to do um, more targeted digitization that perhaps cuts across both the distinctive and the general collections, um, in addition to, to sort of more, um, more acquisition-oriented practices where perhaps we purchase from smaller publishers, um, where we um, can do more co uh, collection development uh, collectively to enable us to um, have access to the quote-unquote canonical works from Yale and Harvard University presses, but then also go to those smaller independent presses and, and, um, and build strength in those areas. And I want to thank you for giving me a new word, bibliodiversity. Totally. Totally going to take that. I'll Creative Commons it. Give you credit. Thank you. I want to thank all of our, we are now at time, so I want to thank all of our panelists, Sherry Michaels, Michael Rodriguez, and Carrie Scott for uh, joining us today. And thanks again to Matthew for coordinating. Thank you, Laurie. I will open it up now for any other questions for any of the panelists or presenters that we've had today. We do actually have a couple of more. While we're waiting to see if we get any more of those, we do have a couple of more questions that I think maybe the panelists might want to um, answer or anyone else actually on the um, who's spoken today. But one of them is some scholars and journalists are positioned that the post-COVID future of higher ed may involve fewer and larger institutions and the folding of smaller schools. Do you envisage, envisage this is a possibility? And if so, how do you think that the ideas and philosophies of shared print fit into this future, and that can be for anyone on the anyone who's spoken today. Just remember to unmute yourselves if you want to answer. Hey Matthew, it's Susan. I'll 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 take a crack at this, even though it's an impossible question to answer, really. <laughs> but uh, uh, certainly speaking uh, from the perspective of East, which has many uh, relatively small libraries, academic libraries, um, as members, it's most assuredly a concern. Um, not only in terms of uh, those libraries themselves, but the longer term sustainability of, um, of East, because obviously we depend upon the, um, the membership dues that those libraries pay. Um, I, I, I don't have a good answer to this, but I, I think as a shared print community, 
It's something we definitely need to be talking more about and thinking about ways that if, in fact, a library ends up closing, not necessarily merging um, or being, uh, you know, becoming a part of something else, what kinds of obligations does the community feel to those collections? And are there ways that we can, as a community, look at continuing to preserve uh, unique or scarcely held materials that may only be held by those particular institutions? So that's kind of, you know, those are the two places where my head goes with, with that question. Thank you, Susan. Anybody else care to comment on that question? Uh, uh, sure, I, I will just offer um, that I feel like this is something that um, we, we would look at the UC uh, sort of network system as, an, as a model. And I don't know if there's anyone here who would like to speak to that, but the kind of um, uh, thinking about service provision and print storage and e-resource uh, acquisition and print acquisition as a as a broad network that spans a region is a is an interesting way to um, to be able to adjust to the changing uh, environment of higher ed. So I don't know if anyone is here that could speak to that. But uh, I see that as, a, as an interesting kind of way to, uh, to think about higher ed flexing a bit with uh, size of institution and with resource, uh, resource sharing, not the ILL kind, but uh, fun funding, uh, funding models. So I, I thought I might, sorry. Um, hi, everyone. This is Allison, um, and I'm a program manager for West and also am on the Rosemont Operations Committee. And I think it's kind of a, a question that's, that keeps coming up. Um, who is responsible in those situations? And if we set up uh, infrastructure to streamline last copies to particular um, institutions or if we are trying to account for those collections one question that arises is is whether uh, we try to um, find community members with the resources like large facilities who are willing to uh, serve as something like large nodes um, and West in a way is an example of that we have five institutions who collect and store the materials in um, identity storage facilities and other members can, sell, can send gap fills. Um, it's not a huge stretch to, I mean, it is in terms of resources and bringing in materials, but when you have a smaller library closing and you can at least identify those unique collections, if you have a large network, a national or North American network of um, libraries that may have the facilities and the resources to bring in some of that material, if that's in place, we could potentially respond to that as a community. There's an interesting precedent for that that Internet Archive said a couple of years ago when uh, I believe it was Marygrove College in Michigan closed completely um, with short notice and actually just showed up and, and packed all of the books into their dumpsters and into their um, containers, their shipping containers, and took them to uh, uh, took them to San Francisco. So while that while that sort of um, that scale may not be feasible for us, that's certainly something to really think about incorporating into our, our future memorandum uh, memorandum of understanding for shared print initiatives. Is what are sort of the collective responsibilities in the event that a um, that an institution is no longer able to fulfill their commitments for any reason. One question just before we um, before we wrap up is, um, is our work dependent on students and hourly labor to the extent that next year will create difficulties in continuing these efforts?
Matthew, this is Susan. I'll, I'll take one more crack at that as well. Um, I, certainly on the access side, many libraries are, if not heavily, at least somewhat dependent upon students as part of fulfilling interlibrary loan requests. That said, it's not clear to me that a lot of fulfillment of interlibrary loan requests is necessarily going to occur, so maybe, maybe that will be a non-issue. And finally, I don't know whether um, Heather's still on the line, but we did have a very specific question about um, the removal of one page of PDF downloads from ETAS, which I know you answered in the chat, but it might be good just to verbally mention if, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I'm just trying to get to where I responded so we can tell people where. Oh. I don't know. But um, I'll just say that the change that Hottie Trust made is consistent with our policy of not enabling download of entire temporary access works. So as we started evaluating usage of the ETAS service and new information became aver becomes available, there are things that Hottie Trust may need to do to alter our functionality and terms of service. So we do expect that ETAS will be necessary for many more months to come. Um, but still, in this case, when we reviewed our functionality, we did want to make sure that it was consistent with our overall policy, which is what implemented the change. And now Thank you have you. a cat bombing us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. So that wraps up.